Here we are, a few days away from Christmas, and we've been traveling this journey through Advent of preparation, uh, preparing for Christ to enter our world and our celebration of that. And uh, uh, Jeremy and I sat down and worked out what we were going to cover. He, he took the faith part, beginning of the month, and then I took uh, hope last week, and, and today we're going to look at love, faith, hope, and love. Um, <laughs> Pretty important and pretty important in our uh, preparation to receive Christ and uh, all that he wants to do in us and, and through us. And I think uh, the reason I, I wanted to, to do the love one this week is uh, because I think that uh, fearless love is absolutely at the center of Christmas the center of Christ entering our world, breaking into it in a radical way, and uh, this idea of fearless love, which, which really was enunciated uh, to the shepherds, you know, on the hillside and the uh, angels and everything. And the first thing that the, God's messenger says is what? Don't be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. God's doing something here. Don't be afraid. And why do you think that the uh, angels said that? Because the shepherds were afraid. It's a natural, natural reaction. And, and so the, the issue be how do we live and how do we see God act in our lives and all around us and in our world uh, with, a, with a fearless love, with a, with a love that's not uh, interfered with. Um, and that's what I want us to look at. Um, our scripture today is not a particularly uh, Christmassy passage, okay? We're not... Not getting three wise men or anything like that. It's uh, from the towards the very back of the Bible, First John chapter four. Familiar, familiar passage. Maybe that these uh, couple of paragraphs are the radical cent center of the Bible, of of what how this all comes together and is played out for us. It says, uh, "Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God." Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son. Isn't that Christmas, right? He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a taking our place sacrifice for our sins. Friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Then skip down. Um, verse 19. No, let's go to verse 18. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. So Lord, that's a lot of truth. Help us to be open to you and help us to discover your love in a, in a radical way, in a fresh way, and help us to uh, live way beyond our fear. This Christmas and beyond. That's our, that's our need in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we love because God first loved us. Uh, we know that um, if we fear, we're not really experiencing the love that God had for us. Um, and, and Christmas is such a weird time. I mean, my goodness, I, it's amazing that people even want to celebrate. Has it ever been weird for y'all? Uh, anybody here have a family to get together with? <laughs> Just kidding. I had mine this week. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday night down in San Diego, the three Westfall bros and spouses got together, and it was as good as it could be. 
the weirdness scale, you know, was creeping, but you know, we were holding it down, if you know what I, if you know what I mean. I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> At any minute, it could go, <laughs> but we were, we were handling it, you know, my sister wasn't there, so that, that kept it down. <laughs> <laughs> And everybody, everybody was on really good behavior, as good as they could get. And uh, you know, we just we, we all walk away. You, we walk away from the Christmas dinner with a big dodge a bullet there. <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I mean? Am I the only one? No. no. <laughs> oh, you've been to my house too. Okay, well, you know, the, but the, isn't that weird that, that you know? And everybody's so looking forward, looking forward, looking forward, and then then they look back on it. And they start thinking, and they look back, and they miss, and what wasn't there, and who wasn't there, and how it could have been different, and what it's not, and what it used to be, and, you know, I mean, you know, all of those things, and then pretty soon we find ourselves going, oh my, why are we doing this? And I, I caught myself this week, because I, I got a little OCD this week, I got a little obsessive compulsive disorder, and, uh, which is unusual for me, because... I may be paranoid, but I'm not really obsessive about it. <laughs> you know, I, I know I know what's going on, but I just keep going. You know, so anyway, I got into this big battle with the insurance company over the fire cleanup and all that stuff that's going on at the church that's not really going on at the church and trying to get this all done. And and I was waking up at three in the morning going, I'm gonna tell them and you know, and that sort of you know, and then that motivated me into my driving, you know. Oh yeah, when I tell you know, and, and all this, and, and it was like and then it suddenly hit me. What are you doing? What are you doing, John? You forgot about Christmas? You forgot about preaching on love, Sunday? <laughs> you forgot about the people you need to care for in the church? You, need to, you forgot about the people in your neighborhood you need to care for? You just set it all aside to obsess about this thing. You know? And I went, wow. Thank you for not doing that to me, but I did it to myself. And, and I realized this is just like the world that Jesus was born into. Everybody had their things and they had their, their I mean, heck, they were traveling to do taxes. Everybody's stewing about something, you know. What if they find this? What if they don't find that? What if they don't believe me? What if, you know? And, uh, and uh, everybody has their stuff and their weird world, tense and stressful and a little bit OCD sometimes and all these things. And Jesus is born right into that. Now, I would have done it differently, okay? And, and if God's listening, he doesn't often listen to the videos, but, but if he was listening, uh, let me just say this. I would have had Jesus, the Christ, God incarnate, the Savior of the world, I would have had him come in with a little bit more splash, right? To say, hey, you guys are all worried about stuff, don't worry, because here I am. And what did we get? Wet swaddling clothes. Wet swaddling clothes in the manger. And it's not really the kind of vision that makes you go, Okay, I think I can set my fears aside. Boy, do I feel loved by God. It's more like, Mary, you going to change that kid? No. <laughs> it's your turn. You know, that, they never had that in the story, but we knew it was there. So I want us to look at this. What is this love that's so central, that, that God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world so that the world could be saved? And he didn't send him into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. So what is this love? And so I think about it, and, and I confess, I'm not somebody who really, I'm not, I'm not good at this loving thing. Um, I'm better at arguing than loving, but I'm going to work on it today. So first of all, I think that love is the ultimate expression of grace. 
of, of getting and uh, giving what we don't deserve. We don't have it coming. And the sense of uh, that it's an action, it's, uh, it's not just a little feeling that we have, but, it, but it's, it's grace put into action. Uh, coming alongside and, and helping people live way beyond themselves and see themselves uh, beyond what they have been told early on. It's grace in action. And so the very fact of God's love and Jesus entering our world is active grace for us. It's not judgment. It's not criticism. It's not critiquing. It's, it's treating us beyond what we deserve. Also, I think this is really important, and this is in the scripture here in 1 John, and that is that love is God's idea. It's God's idea first. We love because why? He first loved us. That's where it starts. If God doesn't first love us, we got no hope here. We might get sentimental, we might get schmaltzy, we might watch that, uh, I think it's the Hallmark Channel now has 24-7 of schmaltzy Christmas movies. It's like every actor who can't get a job now is in the newest Christmas movie. And uh, I've watched a few of them, I admit. <laughs> I always cry at the end, but the lights come on. Uh, yeah, so um, that's not really the love. It, it's, um, it's God's idea and because of that, we can respond to being loved. And, um, and then that leads us to an important truth uh, that, that I've learned in my life, and that is that it's so much easier to try and be loving than it is to allow yourself to be loved. Why is that? Why is it that it's so hard for us to be the recipients of love? We want to do, we want to be, we want to control. We want to be in charge. And so it's difficult, and, and we found this over the years. People are always trying to find ways to love God more, you know, and, but they don't let God love them anymore. Keep God's love away, because that would imply that, that I may need it. And then... And this is an important one, not a popular one, but this is, a, this is the truth. Um, love hurts. There is no love without hurt. Um, Amy Lou Harris sang to that with her boyfriend who died of drugs, but um, that's beside the point. Um, and I think it's the hurt that we experience that kind of shapes us and makes us actually become more lovable. It's the, the hurt. When we live a life free of hurt, we're not all that lovable. Honestly. Not that I've experienced that. Okay, so I haven't done the free of hurt thing, but, but it's the actual hurts and pains and struggles that maybe making us uh, more lovable. Now, um, I uh, found C.S. Lewis, uh, the movie uh, Shadowlands, anybody ever see that? With uh, Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, he does a little uh, monologue where he comes out and talks as C.S. Lewis, and I, I wanted to share a portion of that with you because it just so struck me this week. Um, he says, I think, um, first, he's asking the question, isn't God supposed to be good? Isn't God supposed to love us? You know, why do all these bad things happen? Why is there so much hurt? Uh, isn't God supposed to love us? And he says, I think I'm right in saying by love, most of us mean either kindness or being in love, but surely when we say that God loves us, we don't mean that God is in love with us, do we? Not sitting by the telephone writing letters, I love you madly, sign God, XO, XO, XO. At least I don't think so. Perhaps we mean he's a kind God, kindness in the desire to see others happy. Not happy in this way or that, but just happy. Perhaps we mean that he loves us with a more mature benevolence, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. 
I do like to see the young people enjoying themselves. What does it matter as long as it makes them happy? Is that what God's doing? Here, I'm going to say something which may come as a bit of a shock. I think that God doesn't necessarily want us to be happy. He wants us to be lovable, worthy of love, able to be loved by him. We don't start off being all that lovable, if we're honest. What makes people hard to love? Isn't it what's commonly called selfishness? Selfish people are hard to love because little love comes out of them. God creates us free, free to be selfish. But he adds a mechanism that will penetrate our selfishness and wake us up to the presence of others in the world. And that mechanism is called suffering. To put it another way, get this, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. But why must it be pain? Why can't he wake us up more gently with violins and laughter? Because the dream from which we must be awakened is the dream that all is well. That is the most dangerous illusion of them all. Self-sufficiency is the enemy of salvation. If you are self-sufficient, you have no need of God. If you have no need of God, you don't seek him. If you don't seek him, you don't find him. God loves us, so he makes us the gift of suffering. Through suffering, we release our hold on the toys of the world, and we know our true good lies in another world. We're like blocks of stone out of which the sculptor carves the forms of men and women. The blows of the chisel, which hurts us so much, are what make us perfect. The suffering in the world, get this, is not the failure of God's love. It is that love in action. I think I'm going to start reading that every day this week just to remind myself. The suffering that we have reminds us that all is not well. And we're not well. And we need the Lord. We need Jesus to break into our world in a radical way. Because if we could take care of it ourselves, we would. Trust me, I was raised that from, as a little kid. Don't say anything, don't share anything, and just handle it. And then when I handled it wrong, well, that, that was another thing, you know, a whole other memory. But um, But it's our suffering which makes us lovable, but it also is what fires up our fear. When it's not working, when the pain's there, when life's uncertain, when we're struggling in relationships or life or death or whatever it is, when, when all of that struggle happens, that's when the fears start to grip us. So the very thing that makes us lovable also triggers our fear. And I think that's why John, writing here in, in this letter, has put it all together and says that... that the suffering may be what it takes for us to be lovable. It triggers the fear, but then the love itself is the antidote for the fear. So we can literally live in fearless love. Fearless love. Not because we've got it together, but because even though we don't have it together, Jesus breaks into our world and says, let me show you how lovable you are and how much you are loved. Some of us here had a friend years ago, Steve Hayner, who was a minister at University Press when I was on staff there. We shared together, and he worked with the university students, and then he went on to be the president of uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And then, uh, now he's serving as the president of Columbia Seminary in Atlanta. And last Easter, everything was great. A few weeks after Easter, he was diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer that has 
run through his body. This may be his last um, Christmas with his wife and his children and his grandchildren and the people that he loves. And, um, and I thought, if ever there was a time to be afraid, wouldn't that be it? Uh, you, you don't know the future, but you know things are not good now. And all of that comes together. And I thought, how would he approach Advent? How would he approach um, waiting for Jesus to break into our world? And I want to share with you this uh, Advent poem that he wrote, which becomes more and more poignant as his condition is more and more poignant. Right? Is there grace enough to cover the darkness I discover? To light the inner places long cloaked in sad disgraces? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Is there love enough to lift me when bold rebellion grips me and failure bleakly presses guilt's overwhelming stresses? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Is there peace enough to hold me when nagging fears erode me and strangling expectation turns hopes to desperation? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Is there joy enough to fill me when barren reaches chill me and grieving contemplation brings spirit's isolation? Come, Lord Jesus. Is there grace enough? Is there love enough? Is there peace enough? Is there joy enough? That's why Jesus came. The answer is yes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, come. Fill our hearts with your peace. Remind us of your love quiet our fears, and release us to be men and women of gracious love. Not just for a season, not just till the 26th, but every day, <laughs> however many days we have. Please enter our world. We'll not only celebrate, but we'll welcome you. Amen.